as in what gives life to Mars, is so important. And I'm going to explain that in the relation to our relationship to the Sun. And of course, this relates back to the Treaty of the Sun, which is part of the Covenant of One Heaven, Pactum de Singularis Calum. And then the second visualization tonight is with this in mind, with the covenant in mind, with our understanding of the seriousness and the ability to actually see this happen, the manifestation of giving life to Mars. The second part tonight is the visualization of the changing events over the next 6 to 12 months and how our consciousness and the direction of the consciousness of those that we know and those that we share will alter the destiny that we face. So that rather than dwelling on the feeling of inevitability that we are doomed, rather than dwelling on the feeling that we have no influence on something as vast as the sun, the second part of the visualization tonight will be a visualization of our relationship with the sun and how the first visualization changes our destiny because it changes the way the sun feels about us because this is real. So let's start now with give-mars-life.org and let me explain about what this is. If I said to you normally that the Homo sapiens species has the ability to bring life to a planet. Two or maybe possibly even three things might come to mind. The first is, that's right, sure, that's a bit of a fantasy. The second is, it would be prohibitively expensive. And the third is, in terms of priority, why should we focus on these things when we can't even manage our existing planet? And you'd be right. The idea of bringing life to a planet is a massive idea. In fact, if you go and search the um, areas of uh, science beyond uh, films like Star Trek, there is precious little material that speaks in any credible fashion that the Homo sapiens species, from an academic point at least, believes that bringing life to planets is possible, let alone within our grasp. So you'd be right in feeling that it's the realm of pure science fiction and is a waste of our time and our effort. The second uh, point that we raised is that something in terms of terraforming, something in terms of bringing life to a planet appears to be a prohibitively expensive and awfully complex type endeavour. And in fact, it is. Such an endeavour would cost hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. It would be the largest engineering projects that our species had ever undertaken. But then again, it would be the most singular project that unites the Homo sapiens species as never before. Because without being united, such a process and a project could not possibly happen. And because of the expense and because of the time, the third concern that most people would raise is, why bother when for a few billion dollars we could save starvation in Africa and for a few hundred billion dollars, if we used it properly, we could certainly solve the endemic structural problems of the world and this is true but what we have lacked as a species and what we have lacked in the period certainly for a long long time is an idea that unites us that rises us above our differences of religion an idea that rise, helps rise us above our differences in terms of politics and race and culture and interest something that compels us to think beyond ourselves and whether we realize it or not we are actually at that cusp 
Unfortunately, those that rule the world, those that suffer severe mental illness, Sabatanes, Kazars and others, will not permit the world enough time to bring itself to a mature and a collective unity. Their fear is that too much information would cause mayhem. And some might say that that's right. If you consider us as children, if you consider us as incompetent or as merely intelligent animals, then that's precisely the way you would think. And so the amount of knowledge and information that is being made available to us is extremely limited for that reason. So by the time they decide that they must let us know, five minutes to midnight, is probably going to be too late for us to think beyond the pettiness of our lives when we think about credit cards and money and our garden, when we're thinking about the survival and the future of our planet and life on our planet. So the power of this idea, the importance of this idea, begins with the idea itself. It begins with something that unites us and sets us apart and we say to ourselves, for the next half an hour, even though I have pressing legal matters, even though my family might be facing real health issues of life and death, even though I might be facing uh, my own financial crisis, I'm going to clear my mind and I'm going to entertain the possibility that the Homo sapiens species at some point could unite enough to support the idea of bringing life to a planet, bringing life to Mars. And that's all I ask you to do. Please, for the next 40 minutes, please clear your mind and let's look at the possibility, the idea that we could bring life to Mars. Now I'm going to walk through with you now the steps of how we visualize that. And this is a site, give-mars.life.org. When you go to the home page of that, and again, like many of the sites, they're still in desperate need of completion. And of course, I've, I've been behind the eight ball for quite some time getting these things finished. So I, again, I apologize that these things are not right. But you'll see that there are three boxes in the middle there. One that says Atlas Space Station, one that says Helios Space Station, and that one that speaks of the Phoenix Space Station. Well, I'm not going to get into, because of the time, the detail of the Atlas or the Helios idea. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just give a quick outline, and then I'm going to ask you to click on some links under the Phoenix Space Station. So the idea of Atlas and Helios is this. In space, a spherical structure with rotation will produce, if of sufficient size, its own atmosphere. And the spherical nature of the object causes, with the atmosphere, its shell, its casing, to increase in strength and size such that it becomes impervious to the kind of attacks that we see of specks of space debris and even small objects. Spheres in space, when having rotation and atmosphere, provides an integrity to the object immeasurably greater than what our friends at NASA have done when they have produced structures of fatal integrity. How fatal is the integrity of the International Space Station? The International Space Station is so badly designed in its holistic integrity that an object the size of a cup traveling through space, hitting the space station at speed, could destroy it. And there are hundreds of thousands of those objects. So the first goal and the first task 
of the Homo sapiens species is to get our scientists to start thinking in terms of what Mother Nature tells us and stop thinking that they can reinvent Mother Nature and give us our first space station that is spherical, that is going to be maintainable, that is not going to suffer catastrophic structural failure and that is going to provide for us a beachhead to leapfrog towards the ultimate creation of a sustainable uh, life on Mars. So Atlas then is our first space station of a spherical nature built to orbit the Earth. Helios is our second space station built to support life and work and minerals and mining on the moon. And this is necessary for us to then be able to produce the space stations and the artificial structure of the moon for Mars. So now let's go and have a look at the Phoenix Space Station and what I'm talking about in terms of how uh, to bring uh, life to Mars. So there's the link here, principle, principles of design. So under Phoenix Space Station, principles of design. If you click on that, it will give some background to, to what we're talking about. So currently, Mars has two objects which are called moons, but really they are very large uh, bollards, asteroids, that are in the gravitational force of Mars, uh, Deimos and Phobos. So Phobos um, is in an orbit um, of around about 9,300 kilometres, and uh, Deimos is at an orbit of around about 26,000 kilometres. They're not particularly large compared to our moon, but certainly they are uh, structures that are in, uh, crucial. So the principle of bringing life to Mars, the principle of seeing it rain on Mars, is the realisation that Mars does in fact have an atmosphere, but that atmosphere has not been compressed because it doesn't have a moon of sufficient gravitational force to compress its atmosphere. So the idea of creating an artificial moon, and by artificial moon we merely mean to set in place the uh, structure to then allow nature to complete it, is that if we create it at the right distance and of sufficient size, then in the incredible time of only 60 to 100 years, the atmosphere of Mars can be compressed to the point that it will start to rain on Mars, that Mars's atmosphere will start to compress. And because it is an iron planet like Earth, the, the nature of Mars interacting with the fields of the sun will produce an atmosphere approximating Earth. Now, what is the importance of this? Well, obviously, the importance of it is that if there is a second planet with a life-sustaining atmosphere, then not just the Homo sapiens species, but all life on Earth has a second home. To the sun, and at the moment, the issue at the moment is whether the sun uh, will help us through a gentle transition or whether we will face major disruption to the sun. The sun depends on the earth as a water planet as being a key attraction for comets. Comets have a tail and the reason the sun's uh, own fields change when a comet passes is that comets bring in enormous amounts of hydrogen from the interstellar space. It's like going to a petrol station for the sun. But because there's only one water-based planet in the uh, inner realms of the solar system, the number of comets is limited. If there were two water planets within the inner realms of the solar system, 
the number of comets that could be attracted for the sun 